Okay, so hello. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, continuous documentation and why the best time is now. Uh, what we're going to be having today is going to be a bit different. Uh, I'm not going to be going so much in, into details about how your API documentation should be, but how it actually gets there. So information regarding when you start developing your APIs and how you can avoid some common mistakes that you have um, at the end point. So, um, hello, Tarve. Uh, Tarve basically means hello in Finnish. Uh, my name is Ken Gulumaya Steven, and I'm a front end engineering lead at Bcaster. Uh, Bcaster is a company based out of Finland, and what we do is uh, media management and user generated content management. I'm also the app conveyor and community manager for the Code of Freak. Um, the Code of Freak is a weekend intensive free software engineering bootcamp where we try to get underrepresented folks into tech. You can find me on Twitter at ExpensiveCV. Uh, don't ask me about my handle, I'm not going to explain. <laughs> but yeah, and like I mentioned, I work for Bcaster. Um, so I'm just going to say this. Every time I get to a conference uh, and I start explaining, the next question I get after the conference is about Brexit. So I'm going to put this here. I now live in Finland and this is my government. So if you are tempted to ask me about Brexit, don't. I will tell you about this. <laughs> but yeah, let's go into practical details. So what we'll be talking about today, um, continuous documentation, what is it? Uh, then we will go to why it's important, the common pitfalls in current documentation practices. We will look at how you can improve your documentation by implementing the continuous documentation paradigm. And lastly, uh, continuous documentation moving forward. So just before we go into what is continuous documentation, does anyone have any idea about what this paradigm is all about? Okay, that's good. So, um, it's very similar to the same words you would hear uh, when you talk about continuous integration, continuous deployment. Basically, it says it's a pattern that we've developed at Bcaster, and it's all about taking into consideration your constant changes, and not just the changes to your code, but also changes to your business logic and your business needs. And this is actually required to be reflected in your documentation for every closed proof. So what we have here is instead of having documentation as a post-coding activity, it actually becomes a pre-coding activity. So in our industry, changes are cost so fast. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to catch on with it. This is the same with documentation. Um, your business cases, your use cases, the edge cases that you cover, and your code itself, it changes really fast. Your requirements can change quite fast as well. If you do not actually follow up those changes with the appropriate documentation, what you would have is a dysfunctional API docs in the end. What we actually started out at Bcaster was to try as much as we could to use our release notes. This seemed to be very good, but it also gave us a, a, a very good realization. Uh, and then I, that's why I'm going to ask this question. How many people here actually go through release notes? Okay, that's quite, that's way more help than I've ever seen. <laughs> but generally, um, a lot of our clients who use their products didn't spend so much time going through release notes. Uh, so as much as it was good, it wasn't really serving our use case in terms of passing information. And before I continue again, it's important to understand that documentation is about communication. And communication is a two-way street. So if you feel like you have actually passed out information, but the persons on the end of it are not, being able, are not able to receive that information, your documentation isn't communicating at all whatsoever. So just have that at the back of your mind. When writing code, the documentation is your means of communicating the ideas that you have, or the reasons why certain things are the way they are to your end users. So, in the open source world, we use requests for comments. Um, IRFCs are quite common, and I personally love it. Uh, some companies use it internally, some companies don't. 
Who, which company here uses IRFCs in internally? Okay, one. I'm guessing you work with enterprise products? Okay, yeah, pretty much. And that's mostly the use cases. Yeah, so the problem with RFCs, um, when they're not internal, is that you can have a large chunk of comments. RFCs are supposed to be requests for comments, so as much as you get the, the you're documenting the idea why, or the reasons why you want to make this change, you're asking for comments. Now, a good example of why this can be a problem is the Vue.js 3 Composition API, RFC. When it came out, Ivan was trying to pass in information about what he thought was a good idea to do with the upcoming specs in Vue.js 3. It ended up with almost a thousand comments in less than a day. So if you were actually trying to make sense of it, it became impossible. The other problem was it had more than three revisions in a week. So as much as it was also good, it was really not the best place you actually wanted to gather information as well. So the problem uh, with every documentation comes change. You make a change, you forget to document the change, and it's lost. And then you go again, you make another change, and again you make even more changes. As you go on with making changes and keeping your documentation as a post coding activity, what you have is an unsynchronized knowledge base. So, why is it important? I basically coined this phrase, um, this sentence, I said it at an internal uh, meeting, and someone reminded me of it, so I decided to add it here. The reason behind the change that you failed to document today might become lost forever, resulting in the knowledge base gap. What you end up having is an unsynchronized knowledge base. If you keep your coding, you, if you keep your documentation, the rights in your documentation, as a post-coding activity, you might forget the exact reasons why. When you do that, the reason why certain changes were made are no longer documented. Of course, you can still go ahead to document them, but not in the exact way that you would have liked to explain them. So, when you keep on missing the changes, you make a change and you keep it as a post-coding activity and you continue, what you end up having is an unsynchronized knowledge base, where your code actually does something different than what your documentation actually says to your end users and your clients. This is not a problem when you work in the startup world. However, when you start having service level agreements, then it becomes a huge problem and you could be liable for millions as well. So, let's look at typical documentation types. Proprietary software, you have the docs included and these docs are maintained. Usually, this, uh, this comes with a lot of enterprise products and they have ideally a dedicated documentation to Popular frameworks, um, they also have documentation teams. If you go to the JavaScript frameworks like React, Vue.js, Angular, there's always a group of people who focus specifically, as much as writing code, they focus on making sure that the documentation can actually be used by others. So let's talk about your company. If the developers write the docs in your company, just... Okay, so what? If you have a dedicated documentation team, where you are? Oh, that was a good laugh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, nice. So, uh, different companies handle documentations differently, right? And this basically means that uh, certain platforms which a company A uses would be different from certain platforms which company B uses. However, unlike standard coding languages, we do not have a specific pattern of writing documentation. Yes, we do have the open API spec, but if I'm documenting SDKs for widgets, this doesn't really apply to me, right? Um, do I document my files in Markdown format, in text format, or I just generate them in code? Right, we do not have a unified method for actually doing this, so documentation would differ Based on, will be different based on the product that you're offering and the size of the team. Of course, not every company has the money and the resources uh, to actually have a dedicated documentation team as well. So let's look at the common pitfalls in current documentation practices. I generally put this here because usually when I start this talk and I start talking about peripherals, everyone thinks, yeah, I think we're doing it right. If you actually said to yourself, we're doing it right, you're probably doing it wrong except you're probably Stripe. Uh, I think they're, they're among the few people who are actually doing it right. So, 
This is how we go. We're that close, and then we miss it. So this is usually what happens when you keep the responsibility of making documentation to all your developers. We're very good at it. We can document things, but we document things mostly how we see it. And this is not really a bad thing. This just means that there needs to be other steps as well when making your documentation. So let's look at simple things you're probably doing wrong. Readings. So let's look at internal documentation. Um, if you go to some open source projects, you find out that you have a lot of text in your readings. You go through, I think, generally, you can go as much as 2,000 lines in a readme. I, I wouldn't mention it, but there is one. And it's quite popular, you'll be surprised. Uh, you, probably haven't see, you probably haven't noticed it because you might get some information in it, but there are tons of them out there. Now, whereas this seems to be good, it's basically clocked up. Now, I spend a lot of time teaching beginners. I've been doing that for the past four years. One of the things you find out when you meet junior engineers and people who are getting started in the industry is that if they go to your repository and in three, four, five minutes they can't find the information they need, they're already tired. They feel frustrated. Let's look at unhelpful phrasing. So this is the interesting one. Who uses a word checker for their documentation? Okay, a couple of hands. Um, we also didn't use a word checker uh, prior to when we started the continuous documentation paradigm because mostly we didn't think it was too important. However, it's actually very important. And I'm going to highlight a few things that have been going on for maybe 10, 15 years that you never thought of, but actually are not nice to have in your documentation as well. Now, let's look at inconsidered writing. Can you take your documentation and give to a non-technical person and expect them to make sense of it? I think this is the single biggest challenge that we have as engineers. Because when we write documentation, and when you leave documentation to be authored by us, we would write it with a lot of technical stuff. Now, it does make sense because when I'm writing it, my assumption is that everyone who is consuming this documentation basically understands this product the way I do. That's why I would document it that way. Where the problem comes is that you are basically assuming people's knowledge. So you might not know that you might be creating problems for people, but imagine if you document a specific endpoint with a lot of technical words. And this is something you come across quite often, especially in open source projects. Now, I'm a junior software engineer, or I'm just getting started. I get there, and you say this, uh, you should simply do it this way. Now I go to my computer, I try to simply do it this way, and it doesn't work. I begin to question myself, am I smart enough to be in this industry? Am I capable enough to be in this industry? Unknown to you, you have used words or phrases that have basically resulted in me having self-doubt because you have assumed my level of experience or my knowledge without even knowing me. But when you write documentation, that's what basically you're doing. You're communicating to someone else that you do not know about. So let's look at readings. Readings are supposed to be an entry point to your documentation as, it, as opposed to it being your main documentation. So if you, for any reason, have any repositories, <coughs> and this specifically I'm talking about in panel docs, because you might have a junior engineer tomorrow who comes on your team and makes to work, and they will basically face that. If you have your entire chunk of docs in your readings, please change it. It doesn't help me, it doesn't help you, it doesn't help anyone really. If you have in modern three sections, I would say three, four sections in a readme, that already signifies that you have a lot of information that needs to be somewhere else. Ever heard about clutter? That's exactly what extensive readmes are. So try as much as you can to have your readmes act as a quick start or a getting started guide. That's basically what they're for. Every other thing should basically be referenced in another background document as you wish. It can be an external link to something else or somewhere else, but your readme should just be an intro point to that repository that you have. So when you go back to work, you should do that. 
<laughs> no, please don't do that. I wasn't the one who said that. Okay, let's look at the unhelpful phrasing. Simply run the test. Who hasn't written this before? Be honest. Okay, maybe two or three hands. Now, I'm going to give you an example. So, uh, we, use, we teach a lot of things uh, at Code of Freak, and one of the common things you find in a JavaScript ecosystem is this, simply run the test. Now, we have one of our students who went to the repository, and, and he said simply run the test by writing npm test. Right. So he goes, he writes npm test, and it gave him a bunch of errors. And he was struggling with it for almost five minutes. And then he writes me and says, it says it's supposed to be simple, but it's not. I'm struggling with this. I don't think I'm caught up for this industry. Maybe I should go back to civil engineering. And I go, okay, can I see your package JSON file? Of course, the problem was, just was missing. He didn't know that. He didn't have that information. He needed to run npm install. He didn't run npm install initially because what he thought he ran didn't actually work. Now he created the bias and he starts questioning himself. But you see this in a lot of, and we write this even inside our internal docs. What this ends up bringing is making people as you. So please, if you have things like this, try as much as you can to actually change them. Just like a compiler, then it works. Then it simply works. You see this a lot in the Golang repositories. Um, this is, uh, and I know because I've also written that before. I'm quite guilty as well, but we learn from our mistakes. That's why I'm having this talk today. So, simply, just, simple, actually, easy, easily, obviously. If you have these phrases, try as much as you can to avoid using them, replace them. What you're doing is you're assuming people's technical knowledge, you're assuming people's abilities. And when they're not able to do it because you said it's simple, they start doubting themselves. So try as much as you can to eliminate this. And I'm not just talking about internal docs. If you have this even in your main API docs that are public, try as much as you can to eliminate those. Now let's go to inconsistent writing. Gender favorite. So this one is very interesting because I think it's probably the one that we're quite used to now and the one thing we try to, everyone tries to avoid. Um, but it's still there. A lot of docs still have it. If you're involved in open source projects, Please go back and check, you will see them, and they're not just in RFCs, you can also find them in the main readings as well. So try as much as you can to avoid gender favoring phrases. Avoid race related phrases as well. Now, this is a tricky one, but I will show you how to deal with it. Now, what I'm going to show is those that I'm actually quite conversant with, and I've tried to correct over time, both in the open source community as well as internally. Polarizing or unequal phrases. You see this a lot in RFCs. It has always been like that. This industry is all about change. If it has always been like that, if we stick to those, we wouldn't be where we are today. So try as much as you can to actually change using this kind of phrases. And you might not see this so much in open source, but internally, you will see this. We all have that one guy. Everyone has that one guy at the company. It has always been like that. It doesn't have to always be like that. It can change. So this is not a response you should have in your internal RFCs for any reason whatsoever. So let's look how to improve the continuous documentation. Preconceptions are pure evil. I have this Halloween one here because I'm going to actually point out something that a lot of people might not have thought about. Maybe it's something, because it's been there for 10, 15 years. I came to the industry, I met it, but I'm hell-bent in making sure we don't use those kind of words or phrases again. So, always remember that documentation is a form of communication. Communication is a tourist street, so if your documentation is ambiguous, you have actually failed to communicate. Now, our process is easy. We make changes, we document those changes, but the important part of this entire process is the last one. The screen those updated docs. Now, we've developed a pattern where every year, if you create a new doc today, by this time next year, 
our bot is actually going to raise a pull request that says that documentation needs review. Now we do this to make sure, not because we're not assuming that our docs are bad, but we do this to make sure that the words we use when we actually have that product are still valid and a better, an accurate description of what we currently have. Another reason why we do this as screen update the docs is because your documentation is just as important as code. And I know this for sure because we can spend so much time reviewing code. We can meet speak the tiniest of things. But you see that markdown file that the companies that pull request, no one goes through it. Everyone just seems, oh, okay, it's fine, it's markdown, there's no code there. No, as much time you spend in code, you should also spend in reviewing your documentation changes. They are just as important as the code you actually write. Now, let's look at readme's and how we can make them better. So, first ensure that your document is in markdown format. You can decide to use whatever you want, but I believe the markdown format is a good one because it allows even non-technical people to actually contribute to this documentation as well. Badges are good. I love badges, especially if you have public documentation. Um, put as many badges as you can. It, it creates some, sense, some kind of sense of false confidence. But if I come to your repository that I'm going to use, and I see that all the tests are passing, even if I don't know that the tests are shitty or not, I'm not going to go and investigate the tests. It just gives me that false sense of security, like, okay, this repository is up to date. So create a separate folder for docs in every repository. Markdown documents can be used to link to other Markdown documents as well. So you have your readme's, but you should have a docs folder where this information actually goes into. Your readme's should simply contain the description, getting started installation instructions. Every other detail should be a link to respective markdown. Like I mentioned earlier, your readme's are supposed to be an entry point to your repository documentation, not your actual documentation. So if you have too many sections there, consider removing them and linking them in your docs folder. Now let's look at the helpful phrasing. <laughs> Documentation is a tool for communication as opposed to a place for you to expand your ego. So in your references, don't tell me things like, it has always been like that. If you want to explain to me, tell me why it has always been like that. Call a non-technical person to actually read those docs as well. A second pair of eyes is always, always good. Review documentation changes just as rigorously as you review your code. It's equally just as important. And let's go to the interesting part. Don't you think primary replica is better than master slave? Now, master slave has been in existence even before I got into tech. This is something you find in the DevOps world a lot. But if you understand my history as a black person, you know that I will definitely find this offensive. Now, like I mentioned, your documentation is a means of communication. Right. This one might not mean anything to certain demographics. To me, it does mean something. So when I see this, it automatically sets a trigger. A trigger that you probably did not intentionally want to set, but because you probably did not think about it, this could actually set a trigger. And what you're trying to say is we have a, a main and a replica of the main. So there are better words and better phrases but we don't change it. We don't make those changes because this has been in existence and we just follow the status quo. Let's look at another one. How about we use allow list and deny list instead of white list and blacklist? Now, this is race related. And basically what this is saying is white is good and black is bad. This does not really help me. It doesn't help you. It doesn't help anyone else. This basically also sets a trigger because it introduces a racial tone that you do not actually need in your documentation. Doesn't hear anyone sound more better than here, guys. There are a lot of ways to actually improve your documentation. I'm pretty sure that there are probably a lot of them I can't mention but that you will think of. So if you go back and you look at your docs, try as much as you can to actually make these changes in your own documentation and the documentation you give to external users as well. So, I'm guessing you're thinking of a lot of phrases by now. 
you know, maybe, maybe considering some things you could actually change. And I implore you, please do it. Please change it. We all need to make tech more inclusive and more interesting. So, uh, just in conclusion, uh, release notes are nice. Um, I think they're a must. You should have them. I go through release notes a lot. I think that's where I get a lot of information. So, I mean, not a lot of people will go through them, but I think it's also quite important to have those. So, regardless of the size of your company, or if you use semantic versioning, just for every release, please have some kind of information that people can go to and understand what changes we made. There's no such thing like too much of a good documentation. I'm pretty sure Nathaniel can actually tell us that in two years they still make changes to the documentation. Stripe still makes a lot of changes to the documentation frequently. So there's nothing like the documentation is perfect. There's still a lot of improvements you can do, and if you have the chance to do that, please do. Doctor generating documentation from code is good. It comes with certain problems, and that's things like gender favoring phrases, which you might not necessarily have, but if <coughs> these are basically written, generated from code that you have actually written and comments you've actually added, it's the same comments that you have that are actually generated as well. It doesn't, there's no magic about it. So if in my, in my particular endpoint, I've used a polarizing phrase, it's still going to come out in my auto-generated documentation. So while they're good, you need to also treat them in the last quality. Review those auto-generated auto documentation just as well. Do not assume that they're perfect because there's still a lot of things that can be improved there. So moving forward, continuous documentation is all about continuous improvement to your documentation practices. All we were trying to propose is that as you go and improve in your documentation, if there are certain practices that you find really useful, please share with us and share with the community so we can have something more of a unified way of actually checking most of this. And to do this, we actually started working on a tool. So um, it's like a documentation spec. It's called Doclint, and you can find it um, from my GitHub. Uh, it's called Doclint as well. Um, and we're targeting different platforms. So what we're currently working on is a core JavaScript package that's very similar to ESLint, but we're also working on a Rust package that makes it possible to be installed on any system whatsoever. And we have browser extensions that we're working on as well, uh, a Mozilla extension for Firefox, and then a Google ex uh, Chrome extension for Google Chrome. So um, we basically have a set of rules, but it's just been me and two of my friends from Nokia uh, who have been working in this kind of technical steering committee with regards to this. And as much as we have the tools that we currently use internally, we've built out from this tech, we find it important and also imperative for something this critical to be driven by the community. So if you're interested in having a conversation about this, I'd be more than happy to actually uh, go ahead and share. So like I mentioned, uh, we have a JavaScript package and these are other platforms. We have a Rust CLI, um, which is also still in the works. And then we have the browser extensions that we currently target. So yeah, if you're interested in helping out, please reach out to me. I'm going to be here uh, for about an hour more. I'll be more interested in hearing what you have to say and how we could actually uh, contribute and improve our documentation online. But that's it for today. Thank you very much. <laughs>